Bonsoir. Shall we get my first guest out, ladies and gentlemen? He is one of the best broadcasters in the country, one of my favourites as well. Thank... <laughs> I was going to say TFI, then I realised what it was, and we were getting in trouble again. <laughs> Here he is. Thank <laughs> heavens, it's Chris, ladies and gentlemen. Chris Evans. <laughs> So we've got that. What now? Well, you, so you brought a bowl of water on. Is that for now? Is that for later? What is that? Well, do you know what it is? You know when you go for a ride out somewhere, yes. you know, or you, you go on a journey, a day trip, or yeah. you take things you might need. That's true. So I brought, I'm on a chat show, I brought some things I might need. So in case things, uh, you, you, you want to liven them up, or you yeah. want to show, you've got that there? Well, I've got that there. I've got some funny stories in my head, because I might need those. Good, good, good. I've got me, uh, me Ginger Island book. What is the Ginger Island? You might find out if we need it. I see, so it's not necessarily we're going to stumble upon that. No, no, <laughs> but, but uh, that's there. Um, we can use that if it goes a bit flat in the middle. Okay. All well, right. Well, how, hang on. You've seen, you've seen this show. It never goes flat in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heaven. Thank <laughs> heaven. Uh, well, well, then we won't need it. But it's there in case we fancy livening it up even more. Yeah, but you've, okay. I, I want the, the, the people in the audience, the viewers at home, to think, what's going to happen with that? What is going to happen with that? I think we'll, we'll have a bit of magic. Okay. Bit of magic. <laughs> TV magic, okay, TV well, gold. Let's, let's save that then. We'll save that. Yeah. I'm now excited. I know you're excited. Now, I, know, I, know, I can I tell. I'm excited anyway. You're coming on, but I'm even more excited. Hey, Chris, when did your hair turn that lovely snowy white? So you now look like a wise old owl. When like, I had... like someone who would bring you mail in Harry Potter, rather than you used to look like a little ginger ball of fun, and now you look like a beautiful old cat that's best days are behind him, that lies by the fire, slightly well, it's true, slightly injured, and you're thinking, should I put it out of his misery? No, no, because he's my friend. He's my companion. Well, that's nice. He actually. <laughs> He's actually turned this colour when I heard I was coming on your show. Because <laughs> I, I was so nervous about coming on the show. No, you, you know I was. But I can't believe... Can you believe he would be nervous? Because you've done live shows over the years you've yeah. done. I mean, how many... I don't know how many years you did The Big Breakfast for, but it was a, a good 17 few years. years. Okay. It was a while, a chunk <laughs> of your life. Uh, and that was a big, big, explosive, exciting show where they threw everything at you. You yeah. did a bit of everything. You did game shows, you did interviews, you did current affairs, you did everything on that show. You cope with that. Why would an interview hold any, any problems for you? Because I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I watch your show and, I, you know, you're very good and uh, people come on and, I, you know, when people used to come on TFI Friday, you know, I, I, it's, up, it's up to them to, to, to make it happen. And I've never really done that. I've never really... I, get, I did Parkinson once, which was... No, it's not the same, is it? No, it's like in a so. library. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is, this is on fire. We're rocking, you know, so I, was, I just don't want to let you down. Well, you won't let me down. Of course you won't. But I wondered whether... Here's, when someone told me you were nervous, I thought, well, I wonder if it's because he hasn't done as much TV recently because you deliberately stepped away... Well, for a while, you stepped away from, from well, from work. Uh, really, life, actually, you? Was, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Well, you did. You kind of... You were... How long did you holiday for, if you count that as a holiday? Well, I mean, I holidayed a bit while while I was still at it, because I didn't put any effort in anymore, you know, and I'd, I'd lost the plot. But I went away to, in the wilderness for, like, I think it was five or six years. In fact, the first series of this show, and I can't remember what, when that was, what year was that? This was, uh, I think this was 2001. OK, because you wrote to me, and you asked me to come on your first yeah, series. I did, I did. And you gave me a lovely handwritten note, yeah. and it came to my, my... I lived on a farm at the time, I had my own farm. It was delivered by an owl, a silver-haired owl. Yeah, it was. <laughs> That's where I got the idea from. Uh, let's go with that, I thought. That's a look, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you gave this lovely handwritten note, and I thought... I, and I wrote back to you, I said, I, I'm not at it anymore. And yeah. I never thought... I, I actually never thought at that point I'd ever do anything so like So you this never again. thought you would go back into the, not just TV, but radio as well? Everything. You, you turned... I, was, I was gone. I was, I was digging holes. I literally was digging holes. I was a crazy... Uh, but, but I was a crazy. <laughs> I'm still a little crazy. <laughs> that That's why I was nervous about coming on in case I got crazy. Yeah, oh no, I'm getting crazy. <laughs> uh, but uh, how did you get crazy? Um, because I just lost control of the whole situation. I worked really hard as a kid. That's what the book is all about. Okay, and now this is Chris has got a book out, which is uh, it's kind of the first chunk of your life story. It doesn't come right up to date, no, but it, it covers some very interesting, exciting years. It starts with you being a uh, little kid, being we, born, being born. Okay, yeah. so it's right near the beginning. Yes. Depends whether you believe in, in reincarnation or not. And it goes through. Uh, it's called. It's not what you think. And it goes through the periods when when it was, Chris became like you know ubiquitous. We all know who Chris was. You couldn't turn on the TV and radio without seeing him. It seemed, and then the, the kind of point where you begin to change. 
Yeah, well, what happened was I worked really hard. You know, as a kid, my dad died. Got a job in a paper shop because um, he wouldn't let me. Be, he wouldn't let me work for a living because because he didn't want his kids working. He thought, no, no, I'm going to give him the pocket money. Then dad passed away. Got a job in a paper shop. Worked as a paper boy. Then I was the marker upper. I got a bit of a promotion. Then I collected the money uh, from the rounds. You know, when people have their papers delivered, some people are not only too lazy to have the paper to go and get their papers, but to to pay for them at the end of the day, you've got to go and get that off them as well. Okay. Uh, I'm so I'm so lazy now. I pay someone to read the papers for me as well. I don't, do you? I don't get delivered, and I don't I, even look at them. I thought you had a wise old owl who delivered them for you. <laughs> don't you dare talk about my wife like that. Oh, right. <laughs> no, but, then, but then, obviously, worked really hard, got into radio, came down to London, started again at the bottom, worked on your show. Hold it. My show's not the bottom. What are you <laughs> talking about? Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan, the show that I worked on for you was the bottom. You were excited because it was a big thing. I was very was excited, a, yeah, and then yeah. I, got to, I got put on the radio myself, <laughs> and then the big breakfast came along, and then I earned a load of money, and then I... Then, you know, TFI came along, I earned a load more money. And then, after all that hard work, yeah, really hard work, I did, like, I made one, you know, one silly mistake, maybe two silly mistakes, and, and nearly threw it all away. Now, who would do such a thing, Jonathan? <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> I don't know either. It's only me. I don't think there are any parallels that can be drawn from that whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so you... Uh, but you said you made a couple of mistakes. I don't remember you making specific mistakes. I remember... I, I remember from, from the way it looked to me, and I, I'm hoping you feel the same way, was here was this guy who, who kind of achieved... It looked like everything you wanted to achieve. Yeah. Okay, More, you, you, you'd, con you'd conquered TV, you'd conquered radio, you'd gone to... The, it was crazy. No one uh, that I knew of would have thought of, of, of having the kind of nerve or the moxie or the kind of wherewithal to buy the radio station that initially employed them, so they owned their own station, which you did. You found yourself in the position. Incredible story. And then you'd have thought, OK, well, now he's just going to relax and enjoy it. But that seemed to be like, uh, either that wasn't enough for you or maybe that was too much for you. Well, I borrowed £85 million pounds one day. Um, <laughs> Which yeah, let me just ask, I bet you wore your smartest suit when you went to the first. <laughs> Do you know what happened? OK, I wore the same clothes every day for six weeks. Not literally, but the same outfit. I had several of them. Um, and I wore a black suit and a black pearl net sweater. Yeah. Just in case I was seen by anybody who might be lending this money at any point in the street or anywhere in the world. So you looked smart at all times? Yeah, and I also... I, then I, st I stayed in a hotel for the whole six weeks. And the hotel was equidistant from all the places I needed to be at any point to borrow the money. So you were borrowing money from a number of different sources? Oh, yeah. Yeah. it was £85 million. Pounds. Yeah, I know, I know, it's a lot of money. And back then, that's when £85 million pounds really was £85 million. Pounds. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I needed £87, uh, but I had two. And the bank found out that I had two. And they, said, they sat me down one day and they said, so how much money do you have? And I honestly didn't know and I paused. And I said, uh, I said... I think I've got about two million pounds, which is what I had in the bank. Yeah. That's what I had. And you knew that, and they knew that. Well, I sort of knew that, but I wasn't sure. That's why I paused. And they said, OK, well, we'd like you to put that into the deal. And that's the first. It's called junior debt, which means if it all goes wrong, that's the last to get paid out. Oh, I see. So you're never going to get that back. So that, that, that's these on a plate. Yeah. I didn't bring the plate. I just brought the bow with Can I be water. honest with you, though? But not literally, because they're not worth two million to anyone. <laughs> I've seen them, as most of us has, because you used to get them out all the time on TV. <laughs> well, they're insured for two million, but as we know, you can over-insure anything now. So, 80... That's a... Uh, and how old were you then? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. This so must be, what, 15 years ago? 97. 97. So, okay, what's that? That's uh, nine 31 years ago. years old. So, you were 31. Imagine at 31, put, putting yourself on and borrowing £85 million. Pounds. I mean, that's, a, that's an absurd amount of responsibility to heap on yourself. And you must have been aware of that. You must have been... Yeah, but I was, I was more nervous about coming on this show, and I'm not joking, yeah. than I was about borrowing that money, because it's what I wanted to do. I, I You're knew not going to hit me up for a loan, are you? That's not the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm all right for now. We'll okay, see how I'm it sure goes. We'll see um, how it goes. So, uh, so you had that... So, you, it's obviously... And, and obviously that gamble paid off for you. Yeah, but it wasn't a gamble because it meant I got to do... Look, I dreamt about working at a radio station. I dreamt about being on the radio. I then got on the radio, worked with guys like you, learned how to produce things, you know, produce myself, so I benefited from that. I was a good producer, all right presenter, and I was living my dream, yeah? Then you get Radio 1, then you leave Radio 1 because you're an idiot and you don't know what else to do, so you walk out. Brilliant, genius, but, but well was that, done. Now, OK, let me ask you about that because when you're on Radio 1, you had, the, you had the breakfast show on Radio 1. Yeah. OK, which is the biggest show on Radio 1. Yes. Okay, just like you've now got the breakfast show on Radio 2, which is the biggest show on Radio 2. Yes. But you had that breakfast show, and you're doing that show, and, and you, so most people think, OK, I've arrived, and, and obviously there's a finite period you can do that for, but most people will be satisfied with that, I think. Obviously, you're not most people, so what went on in your head that you decided, OK, this is now what, did it get boring? Did it, did, did it not excite you anymore? Look, it's not coal mining, it's not nursing, it's not saving lives, but it was a lot of work and a lot of hours, and it had been going on for years and years and years. Then I had lots of opportunities, yeah. both, you know, financial... I mean, some amazing people, amazing times. We're in the middle of, well, t you know, Britpop had just sort of zenithed. 
and yeah. we were we we were rock and roll. So and you I, felt like I you're, you're, the, real. you're the center of the hippest part of the planet. Yeah. You're on the hippest radio station. Yeah. You've got the hippest show. Yeah. Okay. You're hanging out with whoever you want. Yeah, yeah. And you used to just go off on benders, didn't you? You'd go, you'd disappear for. I mean, you'd always be back for the radio show at least initially, but you would after the show. It was, I guess, it's a, what most of us dream of because you you didn't have any real responsibilities. No, I didn't have. Didn't have any. So you'd go out and you go. What do I want to do today? You could go anywhere in the world. You could yeah. do. You used just to fly off, didn't you, and do stuff like that? And yeah, I know. I mean, there's there's great stories in the book about um, gags we did on TFI Friday, which would. I mean, what we tried to do was try try to have fun along with working. But what I forgot to do, and this is the answer to your original question, I just forgot to put in the work. And what happened then is is the content of the work didn't started to suffer. Yeah. I didn't start to get the response that I was used to, which used to get me out of a lot of things that were potentially. Trouble. So things that were People troubling you. People used to let you. me off with things because so, I was oh, good. I so the behaviour when you were outside, yeah, yeah, if you yeah. were being a bit crazy and a bit mad. Yeah, not 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 necessarily in public. I'm just talking about at work. You know, people. Yeah, he's all right because he still delivers. So the you goods. were tricky to work with. No, well, no, no. I, I wasn't delivering. I've always been tricky to work with. Yeah. I'm a tough boss. But, but nobody minded that if you're delivering, yeah, I'd yeah. stop delivering. And That's therefore, the then why are they going to put up with you being a bit of a, a, a bit of an ass if if the show isn't as good Jonathan, as it should be? John, a lot of an ass. Okay. Yeah. How much of an ass? Big ass. Big ass. Huge ass. You knew at that point then, or, or you were aware at that point, that things weren't what you wanted them to be, I guess. That's what, you didn't know why necessarily, but you knew you weren't satisfied with you weren't happy. I'd run out of ideas because I hadn't put the effort in. I, you know me, I always do the groundwork. But was it, was it because of the effort or was it just you'd used up that stock of ideas? You, yeah, you the, kind the, of... I stop putting, if you stop putting petrol in the car, it, it stops going. Yeah. It stopped going. So you weren't using your brain in that way, you were still you were out having fun, you were late nights drinking, that yeah. kind of thing. And, and I forgot, the energy... I mean, th there's a bit in the book, there's one one show on one, one <coughs> breakfast show on Radio One, by the way. You know, I played one record for the whole show. I mean, you know, we're going to save on royalties, but that's not the point, is it? You did the one record. For I played show. one record. What is that about? <laughs> but after you came off air on that show, surely the bosses at One Must said, "We really need to talk. What are you doing? What's going on?" No, they didn't. They didn't at all. And you know, I, I've thought about that, and I've thought about the fact that some of the things we talked about that we shouldn't have talked about at breakfast, and somebody should have come up to me and said, "Chris, you know, you're out of order. Take a holiday." Come back when you're ready, you know, you need a breather. But they didn't. Now, is that their fault? I'm not quite sure, because I would be the first to complain if they didn't give me the freedom that I needed. We've all had bosses that sit on us too hard, you know. I was watching from the outside, and I could see stuff going on. I remember thinking, that's a bit odd. Well, why and didn't you phone me up? Thanks because a lot. I didn't know you that well. All you right. know, and, and I was speaking to friends of yours about it. Can I be honest with you? I was speaking to friends about yours, saying, what's going on with him? Is he OK? And they were going, well, that's how he is. He's a bit mad like that, but you know that's how he is. Right. You know, one in particular I was talking to, a common friend, I won't mention, because he wasn't... He, but he was concerned as well. Was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody showed any of this concern at the time. But, but I don't think you would have listened if they did, would you? Well, we don't know, do we? Well, have a guess. <laughs> Well, <laughs> probably not. No, yeah. you probably would. I, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe they would. I, I guess that's why people didn't, because you seemed... Here's the thing. A lot of people were kind of, not intimidated by you, but so impressed by you. I was intimidated by you a bit, and I know you might find that hard to believe. You're not intimidated by anyone. Not anymore, apart no, your, but I was. your wife, right? Like yeah, that. yeah, of course, scared of her. <laughs> when you came to suddenly this guy, and I thought, wow, who is this guy? He's great. He's so confident. I mean, so confident. I remember seeing you that first time, that first comic relief you came and did, and I remember thinking, Christ, I'm going to have to up my game. We're all going to have to up my game, because you were, so what you were out there. Well, <laughs> talking about 20 years. But, um, <laughs> it, you know, it was, it was scary. And, you, and so I think people are like, oh, it's Chris Evans. He really knows what he's doing. He's, he's almost like he's kind of like got this natural ability that's come from nowhere. So we didn't want to say to you what's going on, because you seem to know. And then, who's going to say to you, you're hosting the Radio 1 show, you're out doing the road show. You kind of restarted the road show. No one would have thought that would work, and it worked. And then you're out and you're doing the show on TV, which is the hippest show on TV for a while. You know, you're doing these things. So no one's going to look at you and say, you're out of control. They're going to say, look, your craziness is what's giving us this. Yeah. Your craziness is what's buying you your life. And then suddenly, and, and I guess it was self-preservation kicked in, you did just remove yourself from the whole thing, albeit in a way which was perhaps seemed not in your power at the time. I mean, it looked like you were being forced rather than jumping. But you were kind of making the move yourself, weren't you? Well, I made the move myself, but I still had TFI Friday. So I finished in 97 at, uh, on, on Radio 1. But I you walked from that. You just walked from I that. I'd only been there a minute in radio, in breakfast radio terms. Yeah. And then I carried on TFI for another three years. But then you walked from the last series, even though it was your company and you'd signed to do it, you just walked away from it, didn't you? Yeah, but I mean, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. That's, yeah. That was the fact. I said I'd had enough, you know. And what, what had happened then is we'd bought the radio station. Yeah. That was the, so in between Radio 1 and TFI finishing... You had Virgin ready to go to. We borrowed the £85 million. Pounds. So we were up again. Do you know what I mean? It didn't What's take it? long to go up again. Just have interest. What, what is the interest rate on £85 million? I have no pounds? idea. <laughs> that must be some bill you're getting at I the end of the month, know. isn't it? No, but what happened... I mean, you know, back to that, our business plan 
was, was way ahead of the game. Because you know when you buy a business, it's all about the exit plan. Do you know about this? I have no idea. Okay, what you do is you buy a business, you figure out your exit plan, you convince the banks that you can go in at one point with a load of money or some money, and you can exit at another point with more money and give them some. So you weren't thinking, I want to own a radio station for the rest of my life. You were thinking, if we get this and we make this work, we can turn it around for a profit and I can get out in three years or something. No, I want to turn it for the rest of my life. But to convince the banks you have to give them an exit plan, a business plan and an exit plan. When strategy. they know they're getting their money back. Yeah, and they got loads of money back because we said to them that, that we'd grow... We'd, we said we'd buy for 87 and we'd sell for between 175 and 300 wow. within five years. Now, did you just make these figures up just to impress them? No, somebody else made them up. Right, so they were, um, but they're kind of made up figures. It's like, no, no, guess. no, they were absolutely true. They were bona fide. And, um, and what happened was we were three and a half years ahead of our business plan wow. and after 18 months we had exit, uh, an exit option. Incredible. And so you, and you took that? Yeah, we sold it for 225, somewhere in the middle. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's remarkable, isn't it? It's, it's incredible. incredible. But you must have felt, because once again, you know, you, it's not like you have a background in business. It's not well, like you run a news agent. Yeah. Hang <laughs> on a minute. That's a business. Yeah, but it's not like you have a, a, a family history or, you know, who deals with these kind of figures and these kind of situations. No, but sums is sums, whether it's yeah, a penny that, or a pound or a million. Yeah, but that's a big sum to play around. Doesn't matter. It's, you know, let's, say it's, let's say we bought for £87, pounds, we sold for £225. Pounds. A lot of people do that every day. Just, yeah. just put some more noughts on that's it. That's true. That's scary, isn't it? No, it's not scary. It's good. It's, it's okay, can I just ask, does it, would it scare you to buy £85 million? Pounds? Yeah. One bloke went, nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the guy who made up the exit plan. Uh, you've got to come back and tell us more of this story, because what a remarkable... Well, it's like the book, it's in two parts, because it has to be, because there's so much went on. Wow, wow. And uh, did you enjoy writing it? I love writing it. It took me ten weeks. I could have, I could have written seven books. Yes. It's know. a great picture on the cover. You know, it's, like, it's, a, it's a very kind of youthful-looking you there. It looks like it's only from two weeks ago. Yeah, but they pulled your face back, didn't they? Oh, the really, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, Radio 2. I would have thought, many would think, uh, the most exciting, the biggest job in British broadcasting, but surely a poison chalice to be handed, because you're being given this job... Whereby, poison what? A uh, chalice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a Greek word. Um, <laughs> surely it, it, it's a double-edged thing, because on the one hand, yeah, it's a great offer. On the other hand, you've got people who love Terry, and don't we all love Terry Wogan? Who doesn't love Terry Wogan? He's not only an institution, he's also one of the warmest and wittiest broadcasters in the history of the media. And, that, and that's, that's what we call styling right there. Look at that, the man at home. <laughs> That was taken two weeks ago by the same bloke who did your book cover. <laughs> um, well, by the way, look at the leg action there. Look at that. And he's, got, he's got his Beatles albums out what, to show what? he's down with the kids. But what's he waiting for, then? You know what's going on there. We've seen that picture from points of view. He's packing. I think, so... I think he's waiting for Lady Wogan, by the looks of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when you were offered this, yes. did it go through your mind, maybe not? Was it like, uh, either, I don't want to take over him, or indeed, was there a fear that you're going to find yourself in the position that you were in when you did Radio 1 on Virgin? OK. Uh, there was no fear at all. It was a fantastic offer. I said yes straight away. And, and what happened at Radio 1 and Virgin will never, ever happen again. Because of why? Because the safety nets are in place. I will never get to that point in my life again. There's no way, Jonathan. And not in a million years. And what are the safety nets you're talking about here? Just, I'm more balanced, I'm measured, I've been through it all before, I realise now how hard i worked, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I know, I've been on Radio 2 for four years anyway, that's the longest I've ever stayed in the job. Is that the longest job you've ever had? Yeah, no. ever, yeah. And, you know, as far as taking over Terry's, Terry's show is concerned with his listeners, um, I've been doing my research, right? And uh, the the, the, these are famously quite passionate about Terry and about the show, and they're, and they're a big part of the show as well. I mean, they interact with the show as it is at the moment. The show kind of couldn't survive without them. They are the show. Mm. That's, uh, Terry's the voice, and that it's their thoughts and their yeah. jokes, and, and it works perfectly. But the average age of a Terry Wogan breakfast listener now on Radio 2 is, guess how old? Don't say 120, don't be rude. I would have thought, thought mid-60s. 53. No, really? OK, and we did this research two weeks ago, OK? 53. 53. The average age of a drive-time listener, which is the show I do, is...? 72. <laughs> 51. 51? Yeah. So there's no real difference There's there. no real difference already. Terry's, Terry's 71. His average listener is 53. Average age is 50. So he's 18 years away from that listener, yeah. right? I'm nine years away from that listener. Yeah. From his listener. OK, now can what I, about can this? Can I be honest with Chris? What? I'm getting bored. Well, All these statistics... <laughs> yeah, well, I think as a 50-year-old, all right? <laughs> <laughs> As a 50-year-old, a 50-year-old today was 18 in 1977. Shut up. Which is when the Sex Pistols were number one. Yes, now you have right? me. So we could, we, could, we could play punk at Radio 2 and Breakfast and we'd be hitting our target audience. But you won't. Um, you would not. I bet you won't play. I put a challenge to you to play the Sex Pistols on your first show on The Breakfast Show. What, as the first record? No, during the first show. What, 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 a challenge, let's make it a bigger challenge. Let's, let's play this. You challenge me to play the Sex Pistols first record, first show. OK. January the 11th. I challenge you, when he takes over Radio 2, January 11th, to play the Sex Pistols first record of the first show, what do you say? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs>
I knew you'd say that. And you're right to say that. <laughs> Don't let me suck you down, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do... Let, do you want to do the water or not? Uh, we'll leave it. Yes. OK, and if you don't need it, at the, you know at the end of the titles... I'll drink it. Like, no, like in a movie, you know they have the outtakes. We'll do it then. Why don't we do it, like, at the end? Then people will watch till the end as well. <laughs> they watch till the end anyway. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, hope you agree. That was a fabulous interview. And what, a, what a remarkable career you've had so far, and long may it continue. And part it's just, two, here we go. I uh, know. Uh, that, is that how you feel about it? That was kind of part one, this is part two coming? Let's call it that, shall we? Uh, let's call it that for now. Ladies and gentlemen, come back on and tell me about part two when it's swinging. Mr Chris Evans. <laughs> Shall we get my next guest out?